Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 4 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that Comron and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view, and that we will be providing no literary critique, at least not about this series. Just love, 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 just love, baby. <laughs> yeah. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We will try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A uh, quick warning, today's episode is very violent, so we uh, suggest no children for this episode, please. Not recommended for children? <laughs> not recommended for children. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> our show is listener supported. If you would like to support us, we would really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we are posting ad-free episodes on Patreon. And as of August 2023, Patreon just added functionality to link your Spotify account to your Patreon. So all of the ad-free episodes can show up in a RSS feed specifically in Spotify. Right on. So that, that's new functionality they added. It's pretty cool. Very cool. And also, we would really like to hear from you. So send any feedback or comments you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right. Chapter four, part one. The chapter begins with Felicin in Skull Cup. <laughs> you know, I, it's, I almost need you in the background to add a, like a eh, kind of like no, <laughs> noise when you do oh, like, yeah? this begins with Felicin in Skull Cup. Eh. You, you want one of those? No, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just down. Gonna, uh, yeah, we need a down, oh, baby. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. this, is, yeah, this yeah. is some tough stuff. Yeah. The far end of Deep Mind had suffered a collapse, and Beneth had been orchestrating the recovery of the bodies of the 30 odd fellow slaves buried within. All had perished in the collapse. Expressionless, Felicin and a dozen other slaves watched from the rest ramp at Twisting's mouth as they awaited the arrival of refilled water casks. The heat had turned even the deepest areas of the mines into sweltering, dripping ovens. Slaves were collapsing by the score every hour below ground. And this reminds me of the miners they brought in to dig in Chernobyl, the mm -hmm. show on HBO. Do you remember that? I haven't watched that show on HBO, but I do remember seeing some scenes like that of, of fellows in their undies because of the heat. Yeah, they were basically stripped down and digging in their underwear because yeah. they were trying to dig. I think it was through the side underground to get to the reactor fire, mm. if I'm wow. not mistaken. I need to watch that. Oh, man. There's one scene in particular that really left an impression on me among a number of them but there was one in particular it's this really beautiful shot it's in the first episode after the explosion happens and mm -hmm. one guy actually goes to see what has happened at the reactor because from the control room they were like that's impossible what you're saying you know because a guard had said like graphite was out visible and one of the guys says that that's impossible that would never happen you know because it's like in the reactor right. it, for it to get out would be impossible so the guy walks up to the edge of this walkway and there's this overhead shot looking down into the reactor and you see the fire and the swirling all the stuff coming out of oh. it and that was a really well orchestrated shot and okay. it, it just was so ominous seeing it from that perspective oh yeah it's a really good show okay for those that haven't seen it later on after the government gets involved and they're trying to get this under control, they go get these miners from somewhere. I forget what they were mining, but very experienced miners, they bring them in to dig and it's so hot they're digging in their underwear. Mm. Kind of reminds me of that type of situation. Yeah, I can see that. And in general, spelunking holds very little appeal to me and disrupting the earth to dig is completely out of the question. Oh, you know, I, I don't yeah. even want to go into these caves, even if it's a stable rock structure. Right. I'm just not interested in it. Well, I, you know, as a kid, I absolutely love the ideas of a, a, of a cave uh, and for some reason. But as an adult, I'm not into the idea of being under the ground before my time. You know, I'm mm -hmm. ta tad claustrophobic. And the idea of the cave-ins freaks me out, too. But especially, I don't know if you know this, but here, uh, I, I forget in this area here, this hill country, it's riddled with caves mm -hmm. and apparently, I mean, so, you know, a cave can be something that's big enough for you to step in a door way. And that might be the extent of what a cave is, but some, there are some cave structures here down in this way. 
in this hill country. And I, I know that there's quite a few actually real close to us that we can go visit. It's kind of wild that it's close to me. I don't want to be close to them yeah. necessarily, but they can stay where they are. I'll stay where, <laughs> I'll stay where I am. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I went into a lava tube when I was a kid one time. Okay. And they had us turn the lights out and it was so dark and quiet in there. And I was like, yeah, I'm not, not really into it. Yeah. Then Carl that did, did Carl's bad and that's cool, but you know, okay. I've been there, done that. Don't want to do it again. Yeah. Carl's bad caverns for the non Texan natives, oh, sorry. the bats flying overhead. Yeah. I'm not too interested in co-mingling with bats anymore. Yes. yes thank you. <laughs> now there, what's I, another, I'll give you another hillside attraction that me and KP have actually been to. There is a bat cave here. And what it is, is an old defunct railway tunnel. Mm -hmm. And this has one of the largest natural habitats of um, a certain type of bat in here. And it, the, during the summer right now, you know, you do have to make reservations. It's not too terribly expensive. It's about three or three to five dollars to go down and and watch this huge exodus of bats where you're seeing. I think it's like three to five million. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, it's crazy. And it was pretty impressive. It's pretty cool to go see. It was, it was something, something to go do on a hot Texas night, you know. Yeah. <laughs> When you're dating, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, moving along. Yes. Heberick tilled the earth of deep soil across the pit from them. It was his second week there, and the cleaner air, in addition to no longer pulling stone carts, had improved his health. Benneth had also facilitated the delivery of a shipment of limes, which had further benefited him. Right on. Got to avoid that scurvy. Dude, you know that's you know the term why the English are called limeys, correct? We've covered this, haven't you we? You taught me that, okay. yes, I on the podcast. Had... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Without the transfer, Hebrick would now be dead. He owed Felice in his life, but this brought her little satisfaction since they rarely spoke to each other anymore. Constantly under the influence of Durhang, Felice could barely drag herself home from Beulah's each night. She slept long hours but gained no rest. Benneth had even complained that her lovemaking had become torpid. It, things are really going off the rails at an accelerated rate with her, it seems. Yeah. Her falling into drugs seemed to have really been the accelerant here. As they would, as they are. She's already, you know, she is already on a destructive course here. It's, you know, she, if she's not careful, she'll kill herself. And that may be what she wants. Yeah, I don't think she's thinking of it that way right now. Yes. But she's just trying to numb everything out. Yeah, she is. And it's hard to watch because, yeah, it's hard yeah. to watch. It's well written. <laughs> Yeah, this whole chapter, what's going on with her, it really, this is my favorite book in the series, but these segments are particularly difficult to get through. Yeah, they're kind of grueling. Even with her dulled responses, she went to Benneth, wanting to be used more and more often. She sought him out when he was drunk, weaving and generous, when he offered her to his friends, to Beulah and other women. Heberg had said, you're numb, girl. Yet your thirst for feeling grows until even pain will do, but you're looking in the wrong places. Felicen had thought wrong places. What did he know of wrong places? The far reach of deep mine was a wrong place. The shaft where the bodies would be dumped. That was a wrong place. Everywhere else is just a shade of good enough. And this is the inner monologue of someone that has lost all hope. It sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Yeah. So young, yeah, definitely just hopeless situation for her. Felicen felt she was ready to move in with Benneth in a few days, perhaps next week, soon. She'd made an issue of her own independence, but it was proving not so great a task to surrender it after all. She heard someone say, lass. Felicen looked up and saw the young Malazan guard, who we know to be Pella. Yeah. Pella grinned and asked, find the quote yet? She asked, what? Pella frowned and said, from Kellon Ved's writings, girl, I suggested you find someone who knew the rest of the passage, I quoted. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. He reached down and raised her chin. She winced in the bright light when he pushed her hair back. He whispered, Durhang, Queen's heart, girl. You look 10 years older than the last time I saw you. And when was that? Two weeks back. Mm. Only two weeks and she's fallen this far. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it doesn't take long for to lose hope in a situation like hers. It is really hard to watch this with her. Felicen mumbled, ask Benneth, and pulled her head away from his touch. Pella asked, ask him what? She said, for me, in your bed. He'll say yes, but only if he's drunk. He'll be drunk tonight. He grieves for the dead with a jug, or two, 
touch me then. Pella straightened and asked, where's Hebrick? Felicen said, Hebrick, deep soil. She thought to ask why he wanted Hebrick instead of her, but the question drifted away. Beneth was paying Captain Salwark a visit, and he planned to take Felicen with him. She realized he wanted to make a deal, and he'd offer her to the captain. As they approached Rat Hole Round from Work Road and passed Beulah's Inn, Beneth grabbed her arm and grumbled, Walk a straight line, lass, and stop dragging your feet. It's what you like, isn't it? Always wanting more. An undercurrent of disgust had come to his tone when he spoke to her. He'd stopped making promises to her. The realization did not bother Felicin, since she'd never believed Beneth anyway. The soldier who guarded the entrance of Sawark's keep said, Hard luck, once they were near. Beneth demanded, What is? The soldier shrugged and said, This morning's cave-in. What else? Beneth said, We might have saved some if Sawark had sent us some help. The soldier said, Save some? What's the point? Sawark's not in the mood if you've come here to complain. His flat eyes flicked to Felicin and he said, If you're here with a gift, that would be another matter. He opened the heavy door and said, he's in the office. Beneth grunted and dragged Felicin through the portal. They ascended a single flight of stairs to Sawark's office. The captain sat behind a desk that seemed cobbled together from driftwood. He sat in a high-backed, plushy, padded chair. A large leather-bound tally book was open before him. Sawark set down his quill and leaned back. Felicin could not recall ever having seen him before. He stared steadily at Beneth, ignoring Felicin as if she was not there. Beneth pushed her down in a chair against the wall, then sat himself down in the lone chair directly facing the captain. He said, ugly rumors, Sawark. Want to hear them? With a soft voice, Sawark said, what will that cost me? Beneth said, nothing. These are free. Sawark prompted, go on then. Beneth said, the doci are talking loud at Beulah's, promising the whirlwind. Sawark scowled and said, more of that nonsense. No wonder you give me this news free, Beneth. It's worthless. <laughs> Beneth said, so I too thought at the beginning, but Sawark interrupted. What else have you to tell me? Beneth's eyes dropped to the ledger on the desk and he asked, you've tallied this morning's dead? Did you find the name you sought? Sawark said, I sought no particular name, Beneth. You think you've guessed something, but there's nothing there. I'm losing patience. Beneth said, there were four mages among the victims. Sawark said, enough! Why are you here? Beneth shrugged and said, a gift. He gestured to Felicin and continued, very young, docile, but ever eager. No spirit to resist. Do whatever you want, Sawark. Sawark's scowl darkened. Beneth pushed on. In exchange, I wish the answer to a single question. The slave, Baden, was arrested this morning. Why? Felicin blinked. She thought, Baden? Was this important? She tried to clear her head. Sawark said, arrested in whipcord lane after curfew. He got away, but one of my men recognized him, and so the arrest was effected this morning. Sawark's watery gaze finally swung to Felicin. He said, very young, you said? 18, 19? You're getting old, Bennett, if you call that very young. Felicin felt his eyes exploring her, and the sensation was anything but pleasing. She fought back a shiver. Beneth said, she's 15, Sawark, but experienced. Arrived but two transports ago. The captain's eyes sharpened on her, and she watched then wondered as all the blood drained from his face. Beneth surged to his feet and said, I'll send another. Two young girls from the last shipment. He pulled Felicin upright and said, I guarantee your satisfaction, Captain. They'll be here within the hour. Sawark said, Beneth, Bodden works for you, does he not? Beneth said, an acquaintance, Sawark not one of my trusted ones. I asked because he's on my reach crew. One less strong man will slow us if you're still holding him tomorrow. Sawark said, live with it, Beneth. Felicin thought, neither one believes the other. Something's happening. I need to think about it. I need to be listening, listening right now. Beneth sighed heavily and said, I shall have to do just that then. Until later, Captain. I'll give a warning here. This is really tough to get through. We thought seeing the beginning of Felicin's experience was bad enough, but it continues to get worse. Yes, right yes it does. Felicin did not resist as Beneth propelled her toward the stairs. Once outside, he pulled her across the round. Breathing hard, Beneth dragged her into the shadows of an alley, then swung her around. In a harsh tone, he said, Who are you, girl? His long-lost daughter? Hood's breath. Clear your wits. Tell me what happened just now in that office. Bodden? What's Bodden to you? 
answer me. Felicen said, he's, he's nothing. He struck her in the face hard enough for light to explode behind her eyes. She fell to the ground. Blood streamed from her nose. Beneth dragged her upright and threw her up against the wall. He said, your full name, lass, tell me. She mumbled, Felicen, just that. He snarled and raised his hand again. She stared at the marks her teeth had left just above the knuckles. She said, no, I swear it. I was a foundling. Disbelief crazed his eyes. He asked, a what? She said, found outside the Fainer Monastery on Mala's Island. The Empress made accusations, followers of Fainer. Heberic, Beneth interrupted. Your ship came from Unta, lass. What do you take me for? You're noble-born. She said, no, only well cared for. Please, Beneth, I'm not lying. I don't understand Sauer. Maybe bought and spun a tail, a lie to save his own skin. Again, he interrupted. Your ship sailed from Unta. You've never even been to Mala's Island. This monastery near which city? She said, Jakarta. There's only two cities on the island. The other is Mala's city. I was sent there for a summer, schooling. I was in training to be a priestess. Ask Hebrick. Beneth, please. He said, name me the poorest quarter in Mala's city. She asked, poorest? He yelled, name it! She said, I don't know. The Fainer Temple is in Dockfront. Is it the poorest? There were slums outside the city lining the Jakarta Road. I was there for but a season, Beneth, and I hardly saw Jakarta. We weren't allowed. Please, Beneth, I don't understand any of this. Why are you hurting me? I've done everything you wanted me to do. I slept with your friends. I let you trade me. I made myself valuable. He struck her again and beat her systematically in silent, cold fury. After the first few blows, Felice curled herself tight around the pain. She struggled to concentrate on her breathing, closing in on that one task. Eventually, she realized that Beneth had stopped and that he had left. She was alone in the alley. She heard occasional voices in the street beyond, but no one approached the narrow aisle she huddled in. She awoke again later. Apparently, she had passed out while crawling toward the alley mouth. The torchlit work road was a dozen paces away. Figures ran through her line of sight. Through the constant ringing in her ears, she heard shouts and screams. The air stank of smoke. She thought to resume crawling, then consciousness slipped away again. Ringing in the ears, flashes of light behind her eyes when he hit her. She definitely got concussed, okay. not to mention the damage to her face. It's terrible. It is. It's awful. And, and I, I fortunately have never been concussed. So uh, if something happens to me after this, bro, it's on you. Um, <laughs> Billy, I'm just kidding. take it easy. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, you know, I had forgotten um, something I had completely forgotten was the recognition from Sawark with oh. Felice. And, you know, that slipped past me. That slipped past me multiple times. <laughs> right. It makes me curious what he wants to know about Bodden. Yeah. Well, because Bennett sees that there's something here that he's missed, you know? Right. And, and he's, and he, for being the king of Skullcap, you know, he can't afford to miss much. Yeah. On that point, his concern over the people that were trapped in the tunnel was interesting to me, yes. given how he treats Felicen, just using her basically. Yeah. For him to be so concerned about the welfare of the other slaves, I didn't expect to see that side of him. I agree. And I'm assuming that's because uh, he probably rose through the ranks himself. So he identifies with them. Yeah, possible. Or that's my, that would be a, a big assumption for me there that he's at least been there or done that. Yeah, he might have had some friends in there. Yeah. Or something. So that was, yeah, but I'm like you, that really, that's kind of strange and touching. And that, and that explains his foul temper to some extent. I was going to make a comment about even him having standards. Yeah. Because I think he's just You're disgusted right. with her drug use at this point. When he stopped making promises to her, you can just tell he right. doesn't value her like he did initially. It is. And well, that's got to be that drug yeah, use. That, that, well, Pella talked about her age, how she looked 10 years older in two weeks. Not just the drugs, it's the lifestyle. Right. I mean, she's being passed around, excuse me. Selling her body for nothing is, and drugs lead to a young girl looking like an old woman at a young age. Right. Lack of sleep, yeah. drug use, drinking alcohol, and the other activities, it all adds up very quickly. The other abusive, yeah, yeah the, the abusive lifestyle is horrible. And being, being abused constantly. Plus, she's also working. Yeah in a labor camp during the day she came in from a pretty soft care for lifestyle and now she's not living an easy yeah. life on top of all the other stuff that we mentioned so that that will yeah. wear you down real quick probably not getting much nutrition yeah, it's all bad yeah it's particularly torturous to have to read through <laughs> it is it's it's it is necessary 
I hate to say it, it it's you know it serves the story and it's hard yeah. to watch this young girl especially because we like I like Gano as her brother and uh it's kind of like hey you're this is your kid's sister it's she's awful it's just dreadful to see his kid sister go through this and he went through some things but apparently the parents draw different kinds of heat <laughs> It's like they each go through some brutal stuff, man. Perrin was treated horrifically by the gods. He was treated by the gods. maliciously Absolutely. by the gods through all of Gardens of the Moon. So it's like, I guess mm -hmm. it's worth seeing it here because this is just folks. But I'm wondering how much the gods have to do with it, if anything. In this particular case, I don't think much. Not much. Felicen felt a cool cloth brush her brow and opened her eyes. Hebrick was bending over her and seemed to be studying her pupils, each in turn. He asked, you with us, lass? Her jaw ached. Her lips were crusted together with scabs. She nodded and realized that she was lying in her own bed. He said, I'm going to rub some oil on your lips. See if we can prize them open without hurting it too much. You need water. She nodded again. He dabbed at her mouth with the oil-soaked cloth strapped onto the stub of his left arm. He spoke as he worked. He said, eventful night for us all. Bodden escaped the jail, lighting a few buildings to flame for diversion. He's hiding somewhere here in Skullcup. No one tried the cliff walls or Sinker Lake. The cordon of guards lining Beetle Road up top reported no attempts to breach, in any case. Sawarks posted a reward. Wants the bastard alive. Not least because Bodden went and killed three of his men. I suspect there's more to the tale. What do you think? Then Benneth reports you missing from the Twisting's work line this morning. Starts me wondering. So I go to talk to him at the midday break. Says he last saw you at Beulah's last night. Says he's cut you loose because you're all used up, sucking more smoke into your lungs than air, as if he ain't to blame for that. But all the while he's talking, I'm studying those cut marks on his knuckles. Benneth was in a fight last night, I see, and the only damage he's sporting is what was done by somebody's teeth. Well, the weeding's done, and nobody's keeping an eye on old Hebrick, so I spent the afternoon looking, checking alleys, expecting the worst, I admit. <laughs> Bodden is quite the hellraiser, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I forget what a beast he is. Causing that much disruption, getting out of there is, uh, on top of them dealing with all the mess with the cave in, this mm has -hmm. really got to really throw this place in a real, real upheaval, I imagine. What a madman. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> love him. I don't even know him well, I, I, and, and I love him because of, just because of this fact that he killed three guys getting out. And <laughs> lit a building on fire. Yeah, it lit three and buildings on fire. It's like three buildings, wasn't it? <laughs> Felicen pushed his arm away. Slowly, she opened her mouth and winced at the pain. She managed to say, Benneth. Her chest hurt with every breath. Hebrick's eyes were hard. He asked, what of him? She said, tell him from me. Tell him I'm sorry. It's crazy how some people are so traumatized that they think it's their fault when something like this happens. That is a hard one to understand. I've known people that have gone through a lot of abuse, and it's not an uncommon thinking that they're somehow responsible for what's, what's done to them. And that's a awful, an awful thing. <laughs> an awful thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, to see somebody go through that and think that, that they've earned that in some way and know that they have not. Right. Hebrick slowly leaned back. She said, I want him to take me back. Tell him, please. Hebrick rose and in a flat voice said, get some rest. Felicen asked for water. He said, coming up, then you sleep. She said, can't. He asked, why not? She said, can't sleep without a pipe. Can't. She sensed him staring at her. He said, your lungs are bruised. You've some cracked ribs. Will tea do? Durhang tea. She told him, make it strong. As he filled her cup, he said, clever story, lass, a foundling. Lucky for you, I'm quick. I say there's a good chance Benneth believes you now. She asked, why? Why do you tell me this? He said, to put you at ease. I guess what I mean is he just might take you back, lass, and brought her the cup. She said, oh, I, I don't understand you, Hebrick. He watched her raise the clay cup to her lips. He said, no, you do not. We are taken to Kalam, who is near the Astara Hills. Nice. A sandstorm approached. Kalam had faced such a storm before. His first task was to leave the road since it ran too close to the sea cliff in places, and such cliffs were known to collapse. The stallion complained as he angled him down the road's scree bank. 
Ignoring the stallion's neck tugs and head tossing, Kalam drove him down and onto the basin, then kicked the animal into a canter. A league and a half ahead was Ladro Landing, and beyond that, Ladro Keep. Kalam did not plan on staying there if he could help it. The Keep's commander was Malazan, and so too were his guards. If he could, Kalam would outrun the worst of the storm and regain the coastal road beyond the Keep, then continue on south to the village of Intisarm. The hills had vanished behind the storm. Hissing a curse, Kalam spurred the stallion into a gallop. As much as he detested horses in principle, <laughs> the animal was magnificent when in full stride, for it seemed to flow effortlessly over the ground with a rhythm forgiving of Kalam's modest skills. He would come no closer to admitting a growing affection toward the stallion. <laughs> Remember how he had an ordinary horse in Gardens of the Moon? Mm -hmm. Does he always have trouble with horses? I know he always hates them. <laughs> Yeah, but, I think so. I think I there's think always so. some issue yes. with who's in control. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And I'm curious in particular. Now, I don't think not not in relation to this horse, because I don't think this horse would be any like particular war horse. But I could get that if maybe war horses he's dealt with being in the military are a different type of aggressive beast. Because I know that the horses will, are trained to attack with their hooves and other things in such a manner in mm. combat, I think. I don't they think can, he's riding those kinds of, like a Destrier. I don't think he's yeah, riding yeah. those kinds of horses. Okay. He's just riding a horse and just doesn't like him and they don't like him and they know, or they don't, they, he don't like him and they know we don't like him. And so they don't like him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I have the picture of like an Arabian type horse here. Yeah. That's kind of the culture we're talking about. The North yes. Africa slash Middle East area. And yes. when we're talking about a stallion from that area, that that's what I think of. That's what I'm thinking of too. They are magnificent. But I, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a scared of them too. <laughs> That's a big animal. Well, I mean, I, I've gotten a cracked eye socket from one, and that wow. was a big horse like this. Uh, I was young. His name was Mister T, and right I should on. not have been riding Mister T. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite I guess, the experience. I guess you learned your lesson <laughs> that you shouldn't be riding Mister T. You get a cracked eye socket. <laughs> yeah. Speaking <laughs> of concussed. Okay. Yeah. That's what happens. I'm sorry. He did not pity the fool. <laughs> That's what he? happens. Oh, okay. <laughs> he did not pity the fool. I pity the fool. <laughs> oh man, I was thinking of Rocky Three, where he's talking smack to Rocky <laughs> when he played Clubber. Oh man, so good. He was mad. He was it just. It was mm. real fun. I love that. Been a while. As Kalam rode, he glanced to see the edge of the storm, less than a hundred paces away. There would be no outrunning it. Kalam saw fist-sized rocks in the leading edge of the storm. The wall would crash over them within minutes. Slightly ahead and on a course that would intercept them, Kalam saw within the ochre cloud a gray stain. He threw himself back in the saddle and sawed the reins. The stallion shrilled and stumbled to a stop. Kalam snarled, you'd thank me if you had half a brain. The gray stain was a swarm of chigger fleas. The voracious insects waited for storms like this one, then rode the winds in search of prey. The worst of it was, one could not see them straight on. Only from the side were they visible. I don't love that. That sounds like a bad time. <laughs> it does sound like a bad time. And we live in Texas, and we're familiar with regular chiggers here. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's like, but these sound like roid rage chiggers. <laughs> it's next level. It's next level chiggers yeah. here. <laughs> And they don't go airborne, right? You generally get them from walking through you grass. Walk through gra yes, you got to walk through the grass. You got to they got to brush up on you. Right. And they're gonna go. They go for the binding stuff like your waistband or your socks. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but flying. I know an individual oh. who was attacked in the crotchal region <laughs> by them. It was not I, I, good. I am for I am fortunate in that. I've done a lot of work on, the, on my, my dad had a piece of land. So he always carried like a bag of sulfur powder and you'd tap it around your waist and your socks and uh, that keep them off of you for the most part. Okay. Keep them off of you. Yeah. But just thinking of them being airborne. Mm, oh, no, I know it's you. horrible. It's a horrific thought. As the swarm swept past ahead of them, the storm struck. That's a mouthful. That's that a sounds... lot of S's, a lot of S's, a lot of yeah. alliteration in that one. <laughs> and they're big ones. Swarm swept, storm struck. <laughs> that's hard sorry the stallion staggered when the wall rolled <laughs> over them 
the world vanished inside a shrieking, whirling ochre haze. Stones and gravel pelted them, drawing flinches from the stallion and grunts of pain from Kalam, who ducked his hooded head and leaned into the wind. Through the slit in his Talaba scarf, he squinted ahead and spurred his mount forward at a walk. He leaned down over the animal's neck, reached out one gloved hand and cupped it over the stallion's left eye to shield it from flying stones and grit. For being out here, Kalam owed him that much. After ten minutes of nothing but flying sand, the stallion snorted and reared. Snapping and crunching sounds rose from beneath them. Kalam squinted down and saw bones on all sides. The storm had blown out a graveyard. Kalam regained control of his mount and nudged the stallion forward. The animal stepped daintily around the skeletal clumps. The coastal road appeared ahead, along with guardhouses flanking what had to be the bridge. Beyond the bridge, Kalam would find Ladro Keep. And I tried to find this on the map, but it's not listed. I assume it's on the coast south of Erlatan. Okay. The single-person guardhouses both gaped empty. Kalam stabled his horse and crossed the compound, then approached the Keep's gatehouse entrance. He ducked within an alcove and found himself beyond the storm's howl for the first time in hours. No guardsman held the post. The lone stone bench was vacant. Kalam raised the heavy iron ring on the wood door, slamming it down hard. He waited. Eventually, he heard the bars being drawn on the other side. The door swung back with a grating sound to reveal an old kitchen servant who regarded him with his one good eye. The man grumbled, inside then, join the others. Kalam edged past the old man and found himself in a large common room. Faces had turned with his entrance. At the far end of the main table, which ran the length of the rectangular chamber, sat four of the keep's Malazan guardsmen. They looked foul-tempered. <laughs> I get two vibes from this scene, both from okay. Quentin Tarantino movies. Okay, bring it. The first one, it reminds me of The Hateful Eight, with Kalam coming in from the storm to find people already sheltered there and then more coming in after. Oh, yeah, totally awesome reference, by the way, and... I get a lot of the same vibes, but for also from some older movies like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, get a lot of hard staring in that movies, you know, and, and the Italians mm. always do the zooming in so you see the eyes real quick. So you get a lot of staring. So, but yes, which is totally a reference to because hateful eight's a, a tribute to that movie as well. So, right. Yeah. Makes sense. I think, by the way, I'd read something the other day. I believe that that could possibly be Quentin's favorite movie The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Yes. It's one of my top. It's been a long time since I watched it, and I don't think I've ever watched it as an adult. I want to say I was a teenager the last time I watched it. You know what? The more I watch it, the funnier it gets because it's so mean. It's really funny. Mm. It's really quite funny. I'll have to try and see if any of my streaming things have it. Yeah. It It was on Prime for a while, but yeah, it's amazing. Okay. And then the second thing that this reminds me of is the bar basement scene in Inglorious (laughs) Bastards with all the tension in the conversation. Is that where Fassbender eats it? Because eventually yes, <laughs> yes. You know, I, i've watched that not that long ago it's that's one of my least watch tarantinos and i love it but i have I, when i've watched it recently i completely forgot about that it was like it, they worked so hard to get the situation under control <laughs> and you think they got mm-hmm. this they got this they got this they don't have this but it's like everyone's dead it's just like <laughs> i love that <laughs> i'm sorry i hope i didn't spoil that for anybody that hadn't watched inglorious bastards you know Yeah, the thing that gives it away is interesting. The cultural differences between indicating a a number of drinks, (laughs) you know, how many fingers you, which fingers you hold up to indicate, you know, yeah, to say it was three drinks. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. But what a tense scene that is. Oh, amazing. It's, it's quite brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's quite brilliant. Another tense scene that comes to mind that is about that level of tension. Have you seen the movie Fury? No, I have not. It's another Brad Pitt movie. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. That's the tank movie, right? Yeah, the tank movie. I don't remember much about that movie except all the tracer rounds being used. (laughs) Like they were firing lasers in that movie, but other than that, it was pretty fun. Yeah, the breakfast scene where they go in that building and then they're eating breakfast with those two women. That's another scene that's very tense. Okay. Just for a prolonged period of time. <laughs> it really uncomfortable. It has know. that level of uncomfortable tension. Yeah. I need to rewatch it. I don't remember Fury that much, but I, I remember enjoying it. That's such a good movie. It's one of my favorite movies. The action in that is just ridiculous. 
I'm, try, I'm trying to get the missus to watch Kelly's Heroes with me, but I don't think I can sell her on it. It's so good. It's so good, man. It's just, it's amazing, dude. It's got. It's everything. hilarious too. It's it's hilarious. It's an action. It's a war movie. It's a heist movie. It's all of the above. It's got Clint Eastwood right. for goodness' sake with Don Rickles and Telly Savalas. I mean, man, come on, and and uh, Donald Sutherland. Yeah, my word, it's a magnif- What a magnificent movie! All right, moving along. <laughs> to one side, next along the table, was a wiry, sunken-eyed woman with a face painted in a style best left to young maidens. <laughs> At her side was an early merchant, probably her husband. I I have made a comment about another woman I knew that was older, dressing in similar manner <laughs> mm-hmm. you know how it makes them just look so much older yes yeah, sometimes it's better to look your age yes just look your age please <laughs> when you're dyeing your hair instead of having your natural color yeah i've known people that look they look way better with their natural hair color but they're clinging oh. to this idea that if i dye my hair it's going to make me look younger it's like no oh. it actually looks <laughs> fake <laughs> because I, I, it's I, all the same I, color seeing as how i've been bald for a majority of my life this is not an issue i struggle with Right. I'm going to say something that's really odd and strange. I'm heavily influenced by it and warped as a child. Frankenstein, the original, the 35, mm-hmm. James Whale movie. I forget Whale. I, I, I can't remember the guy's first name. I may be wrong on the name. But uh, with Boris Karloff and that movie. But you got The Bride of Frankenstein and, and Elsa Lancaster's got that streak. Dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just so into that. I don't know why. I'm so- it's it's that it's Elvira it's 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 Morticia Adams. When I was young, I had the hots for for Carolyn Jones, who played Morticia Adams on the television show The Adams Family. So mm-hmm. it's it's all it's all their fault. It's 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 weird. <laughs> this conversation reminds me of the boys, where Butcher was talking. What was the the <laughs> the, blue the lady's hair. name? That yeah, he said it's been a while since I had a blue hair. <laughs> so it's just oh. ridiculous. It, well, it's funny that you Such should a mention the boys. Character. I know it. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna reference the boys later on. You stole my thunder. Okay, that's, that's too funny. I did not. I love it. I haven't read ahead of to read. see what you're gonna has, say. So know, it's complete. I, I love it. It's just that's, I love it. It's, our minds go to the same places. It's funny. Hilarious. Kalam bowed to the group, then approached the table. Another servant appeared with a fresh jug and a goblet. He hesitated until Kalam settled on where he would sit, opposite the merchant couple. He set the goblet down and poured Kalam a half measure, then backed away. The merchant showed Durhang stained teeth in a welcoming smile. He asked, down from the north then? The wine was some kind of herbal concoction, too sweet and cloying for the climate. Kalam set the goblet down and scowled. He asked, no beer in this hold? The merchant said, aye, and chilled at that. Alas, only the wine is free, courtesy of our host. How are they chilling the beer? They got some Jag Hut chained up in the basement? Just Omtos Falak on command? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> this, is how this, this is how this world works, man. You got somebody, it's like, yeah, they might. Oh, my word. Yeah, there's some really, yeah, it could be something like that. <laughs> I'll just end it at that. We'll just go. <laughs> Kalam muttered, not surprised it's free. <laughs> he gestured to the servant and said, a tankard of beer, if you please. The servant said, cost a sliver. Kalam said, highway robbery, but my thirst is master. He found a clipped jacata and set it on the table. I love the detail that the coin is clipped. You know, I don't know why I find these details so strangely endearing, but I, maybe is this what adds to his levels of realism to me? I mean, just these small little details that are well, like the girl's awful life. It's not a small detail, but it's like, it's necessary. It's like everything he shows is so, makes everything so real to me, Mr. Erickson. Thanks, so thank you. <laughs> but I do like these little details. I agree. It makes it feel like the world is lived in. Yeah. As opposed to just saying it's money. Yeah. It goes beyond that because people, before we had a unified monetary system, they had issues with people shaving coins off, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know, or like they'd bite the coins and yeah. make sure that they had, were the right or metal content, all kinds yeah, of exactly. shenanigans, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the merchant asked, has the village fallen into the sea then? On your way down from Erlatan, how stands the bridge? Kalam saw a small velvet bag on the tabletop in front of the merchant's wife. Kalam glanced up and met her pitted eyes. She gave him a ghastly wink. 
She said, he'll not add to your gossip, Burr Crew, darling. A stranger come in from the storm is all you'll learn from this one. One of the guardsmen raised his hand and said, got something to hide, have you? Not guarding a caravan, just riding alone? Deserting the Erlatan guard? Or maybe spreading the word of Dryjna, or both? Now here you come, expecting the hospitality of the master, Malazan born and bred. Kalam eyed the men. Four belligerent faces. Any denial of the sergeant's accusations would not be believed. The guards had decided he belonged in the dungeon for the night at least, something to break the boredom. Yet Kalam was not interested in shedding blood. He laid his hands flat on the table, slowly rose, and said, A word with you, sergeant, in private. The sergeant's dark face turned ugly. He said, So you can slit my throat? Kalam was surprised. He asked, You believe me capable of that? You wear chain. You've a sword at your belt. You've three companions who no doubt will stay close, if only to eavesdrop on the words we exchange between us. The sergeant rose and growled, I can handle you well enough on my own. He strode to the back wall. Kalam followed and withdrew a small pendant from under his talaba and held it up. He softly asked, Do you recognize this, sergeant? Cautiously, the man leaned forward to study the symbol etched on the pendant's flat surface. Recognition paled his features as he involuntarily mouthed, Claw Master. Uh, <laughs> this guy just saw his life flash before uh, his eyes. You know, that's like realizing that you're about to get in a scrap with Bruce Lee. <laughs> Or, or somebody like that, or Mike Tyson, and it's like, it's yeah, more like Mike Tyson. I think Mike Tyson's is, a better. <laughs> I think Mike Tyson is the more apropos here, because because yes. Kalam is a little Mike Tyson at times. So yeah, it's like realizing, that, oh my good gracious, and he's being very nice to me here. So it's like, I, <laughs> so yes, yeah, very much a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I would say Michael Jai White. Do you know who that is? Yes. Yeah, I, I would say him. Okay. And so the first thing that comes to mind is yet another Quentin Tarantino movie which referenced a possible historical truth when Brad Pitt's character, he was playing what may have been Gene LaBelle, which was a famous stuntman. And he threw Bruce Lee into the side of that car. <laughs> you remember oh, right. that scene at Once Upon a yeah. Time in Hollywood? Yeah. Man. See, I see, I'll have you know that this, I was just talking about this with the missus. She's not really, you know, her and I, I think I've discussed with our cinema taste are really very pretty, far apart so she does not care for tarantino pretty much at all but she loves once upon a time in hollywood and i'm sorry but i'm mm -hmm. not I, I mean yeah it's well done and everything but I, i'm not a huge fan really um i'll put it like this i always say i love all tarantino i do but there are some movies of tarantino's i like more than others and this is gone down it's kind of down there with uh with my other one on the list which is Death what's Proof. the other one Death proof. Death proof. Yeah, I love Death Proof. Don't get me wrong, but it's his. Uh, to me, that's one of his least. It's his. You know, one of his weakest movies. Now, now I say that to say this: Once Upon a Time is not a weak movie in any way, shape, means, or form. It's a beautiful Quentin Tarantino movie. It's not what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting the fantasy. I'm sorry. I went into that with no understanding of what it was going to be. Okay. The first time I watched it, I was admittedly unimpressed. Yeah. Okay. I th see, I've heard everybody spilled before. It, it, it ruined it for me. But the more I think about it, the more I like it, the more I want to see it again. Well, I, I should watch it again because of the fact that my wife would watch that with me. You know, that's one of it. That's at least I can get her to at least watch that Tarantino with me. I, I did get her, get her to watch Django with me because I love Django. And I, I haven't done the hateful eight with her. I think she'd do it. But she, my favorite movie i'm i'm a, I'm a kill but I, know, I love all the early crime dramas now let's just but that's that's like, a, that's like a separate trilogy of movies reservoir dogs pulp fiction jackie brown that's almost like a trilogy that's his crime trilogy you know Let, let's can we let's do something okay we need to have an episode where we hash out the ranking order of these the movies okay yeah i agree that's worthy let's do a special episode on that we'll release it on patreon because I, lo I love Tarantino. I love all things Tarantino. Because we, we could talk about this yeah. for an hour easily. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. We'll say this. We'll say yeah, let's, this. let's do that. Because I want to talk about our personal rankings okay. together. Really. I got that. That's a brilliant idea. That's a great idea. Bring it. Little yeah, long, let's sir. do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Make it so. <laughs> <laughs> Kalam said, 
An end to your questions and accusations, Sergeant. Do not reveal what you know to your men, at least until after I'm gone. Understood? The sergeant nodded and whispered, pardon, sir. <laughs> Kalam made a half smile. He said, your unease is earned. Who about to stride this land, and you and I both know it. You erred today, but do not relax your mistrust. Does the keep commander understand the situation beyond these walls? The sergeant said, aye, he does. Kalam sighed. Makes you and your squad among the lucky ones, sergeant. The sergeant said, aye. Kalam aye. asked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Kalam asked, shall we return to the table now? The sergeant simply shook his head in answer to his squad's querying expressions. Okay. Now, I always love the little head nods. And mm -hmm. let's go back to the boys. Okay. And remember, remember A-Train goes to see Cancer Boy. <laughs> and he makes and he makes the statement to the doc and the doctor kind of gives that head shake like no you you uh -huh. like, this guy ain't making it this guy ain't making it to tonight you know kind of deal and yeah. it's, it's that same nod that like no no it's, it's that same no, kind let, of let's lay out that scene for people that haven't watched okay. the boys okay <clears throat> who was supposed to show up it was supposed to be the invisible guy wasn't it so it's translucent be, like, translucent is supposed to show up to see a young man who's a, it's a, he's a make a wish Yes, and it is translucent is his favorite superhero. Yes. And so A Train shows up and there is like palpable disappointment, shall we say. And we have all the emojis. <laughs> this is live on social media streaming, and so you have all the emojis of everyone being like, Oh, sweet, it's A Train showing up to see this poor young mm -hmm. man with cancer who's dying. <laughs> and and the, the kid is visibly disappointed. <laughs> I mean, just mm -hmm. visibly disappointed the minute A Train shows up like <laughs> I got a train. It's like, man, I asked for translucent. This is like make a wish. Right. And so, it, it, and so he has that look and he gives him some toys and, and there, and it's just an a train is just terrible personality. And I can't remember exactly what said that leads to the him. No, no, I'll, the I'll, I'll, I know what it was. So finish it up. A, a train says, well, I can, I'm the fastest man alive. That has to mean something. Right. And the boy's like, oh yeah, <laughs> you're going to teach me to outrun cancer. <laughs> Oh my word, that's what it was. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and at one point, A-Train's like, I'll come oh. back next week and teach you how to run. And the doctor oh, looks was. at him, and that's what gives him a head shake. Yeah. <laughs> A-Train. No. Like, yeah, oh my the word. boy's not yeah. going to live till next week. Yeah, yeah, he's not here till next week. Okay. Yeah, and we're not uh, we're not laughing at the fact that this kid is sick or no, that, no. you know, he's dying of cancer or anything. It's the darkness of this scene seeing yes. this superhero squirm trying to salvage this bad oh, yeah. situation and, and it, it just keeps the, getting worse and worse nod. yes yeah and then it's that the shake nod. from the doctor it's... the surreptitious head shake from the doctor <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's the same head shake. That's all I was getting at. That's all I'm saying, yes. folks. It's yes. the same head shake. Okay. okay, so in your mind, the sergeant oh. is just like minuscule head shake at his guys here. He's like, mm, yeah, don't ask. Like, yeah, okay, nope, nope. nope. Got it's it. Like a, just a nope. <laughs> as Kalam returned to his beer, the merchant's wife reached for the velvet bag. She said, the soldiers have each requested a reading of their futures and revealed a deck of dragons. She held the deck in both hands, her unblinking eyes on Kalam. She asked, and you, would you know of your future, stranger? Which gods smile upon you? Which gods frown? Kalam interrupted. With contempt in his voice, he said, the gods have little time or inclination to spare us any note. Leave me out of your games, woman. She smiled and said, so you cow the sergeant and now seek to cow me. See the fear your words have wrought in me? I shake with terror. With a disgusted Good. snort, Kalam looked away. The common room boomed as the front door was assailed. The woman cackled, more mysterious travelers. Everyone watched as the doorman reappeared from a side chamber and shuffled toward the door. Whoever waited outside was impatient. Thunder rang imperiously through the room, even as the old man reached for the bar. And this is what's reminding me of the Hateful Eight, right? They keep coming in and then yes. they close the door and they're like yelling where the close nails the are. Door. The nails. <laughs> I, did I, I explain that? Yeah, that's like his version of the thing. That's such a, oh my good gracious. That's such a brutal movie. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. As soon as the bar cleared the latch, the door was pushed hard. The doorman stumbled back. Two armored figures appeared, the first one a woman. Metal rustled and boots thumped as she strode into the center of the chamber. 
Flat eyes surveyed the guards and the other guests, held briefly on each of them before continuing on. Kalam saw no special attention accorded him. The woman had once held rank. Perhaps she still did, although her accoutrement <laughs> and colors announced no present status, nor was the man behind her wearing anything like a uniform. This is a high-class establishment here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. <laughs> Thank you. I try. <laughs> Kalam saw wheels on both their faces and smiled to himself. They'd run into chigger fleas and neither looked too pleased about it. The man jerked suddenly as one bit him somewhere beneath his hauberk. He cursed and began loosening the armor's straps. The woman snapped, no. The man stopped. She was Pardu, a southern plains tribe. Her companion had the look of a northerner, perhaps early. His dusky skin was a shade paler than the woman's and bare of any tribal tattooing. The sergeant snarled, hood's breath, not another step closer. You're both crawling with chiggers. Take the far end of the table. One of the servants will prepare a cedar chip bath, though that will cost you. For a moment, the woman seemed ready to resist, but then she gestured to the unoccupied end of the table with one hand, and her companion responded by pulling two chairs back before seating himself stiffly in one of them. The pardu took the other. She said, a flagon of beer. Now, real quick here, at the mention, I kind of laugh at the cedar chip bath because just today we were talking about using bleach baths for chiggers. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we were. You can oh, okay. put a real light. You can put a light dilution of bleach in there if your if your kids ever get eat up real bad with them, mm -hmm. and make sure they just don't splash it in their eyes or nothing like that. But uh, you know they'll be all right for the. It's what you, you know because you put bleach in pools anyhow. But bleach you don't want it too hot of a bath because it'll it'll apparently it'll mess with the potency of the uh, mm. bleach. But try to keep it cooler. But a little bleach in the water will help get rid of those things. Or you know because they just might they're mites that burrow into your skin. So you can, right. you can take a, you can, it, it'll help, it'll help kill them. I'm trying to remember what other solutions they have. I've seen people use like, they're, they're, they used to have these other little tubes of stuff, but you could just be like, I, you could just, I think you could put a drop of alcohol, but a lot of times they sell, you can just put like a dot of a fingernail polish or, or a lacquer, the fingernail lacquer kind of clear coat over those. It'll suffocate them too. Mm, okay. Interesting. <laughs> the thing Thank you, you for that, that, that old school. Texas. Yeah, it's old school Texas, yeah. Kalam gave her a wry smile and said, the master charges for that. She said, the seven's fate, the cheap bastard. You, servant, bring me a tankard and I'll judge if it's worth any coin. Quickly now. One of the guards said, the woman thinks this is a tavern. The sergeant said, you're here by the grace of this keeps commander. You'll pay for the beer. You'll pay for the bath. And you'll pay for sleeping on this floor. <laughs> the woman asked, and this is grace? The sergeant's expression darkened. He was Malazan, and he shared the room with a claw master. He said, the four walls, the ceiling, the hearth, and the use of the stables are free, woman. Yet you complain like a virgin princess. Accept the hospitality or be gone. The woman's eyes narrowed. Then she removed a handful of jacatas from a belt pouch and slammed them on the tabletop. She smoothly said, I gather that your gracious master charges even you for beer, sergeant. So be it. I have no choice but to buy everyone here a tankard. The sergeant gave a stiff nod and said, generous. The merchant's wife said, the future shall now be prized loose as she trimmed the deck. Kalam saw the party woman flinch upon seeing the cards. Kalam said, spare us. There's nothing to be gained from seeing what's to come, assuming you've any talent at all, which I doubt. Save us all from the embarrassment of your performance. Ignoring him, the old woman angled herself to face the guardsman. She said, all your face rest upon this. She laid out the first card. Kalam barked a laugh. One of the guards demanded, which one is that? Kalam said, obelisk. The woman's a fake. As any seer of talent would know, that card's inactive in seven cities. The merchant's wife snapped, an expert in divination, are you? Kalam said, I visit a worthy seer before any overland journey. It would be foolish to do otherwise. I know the deck, and I've seen when the reading was true, when power showed the hand. No doubt you intended to charge these guardsmen once the reading was done, once you told them how rich they were going to become, how they'd live to ripe old ages, fathering heroes by the score. Her expression unveiling the charade's end, the old woman screamed with rage and flung the deck at Kalam. It struck him on the chest, cards clattering on the tabletop in a wild scatter which settled into a pattern. The breath hissed from the Pardu woman the only sound to be heard within the common room. 
Suddenly sweating, Kalam looked down at the cards. Six surrounded a single, and that single card he knew with certainty was his. The Rope, Assassin of Shadow. Mm. The six cards encircling it were all of one house. King, Herald, Mason, Spinner, Knight, Queen. High House, Death. Hood's House, all arrayed around the one who carries the Holy Book of Drajna. Kalam sighed, ah well, and glanced up at the Pardu woman. He said, I guess I sleep alone tonight. <laughs> and we are going to stop here for this week, and we'll pick up the chapter next week where we left off. Yes. Yes. For standout moments, finding out what the Durahang use has led Felicin to do in the two weeks yeah. was important difficult to get through yeah it, it, it is hard to watch and i get kind of frankly it makes me a little bit down when i read a little bit of this stuff because it's hard to watch eric's such a good writer you just, you feel pain for this young woman going through this stuff i had forgotten about saw work captain saw work recognizing felicin and that she had actually managed to play it off pretty impressed mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it's actually kind of, that's kind of impressive he looked like he had seen a ghost yes so I'm assuming that's a recognition. Mm -hmm. Oh, he absolutely knows who she is. Yeah, I forgot about that, but very interesting. Seeing what Bodin is capable of when he escaped being in jail, he absolutely caused havoc in that town. Yes, he did a lot of damage, and I love it. And he also took advantage of the of the current problem with the, you know, like I said, they're already dealing with that cave-in. So right. this just has more fuel to that fire, quite literally. It's, it's great. He's I love him. <laughs> I enjoyed seeing Kalam navigate his native land. Mm -hmm. These are the types of scenes that contributed to him becoming one of my favorite characters. Yes, I, I, I get it. And I agree because I really love that whole, this whole scene here. It does, it just, because you can hear, I mean, it's, you can hear the wind howling <laughs> while mm -hmm. I'm reading that. Can't you? I can just hear it myself yes. howling through yeah. that thing. I was just, I love it. So true. Such a, I love your hateful light reference. Fantastic scene, by the way. And to be clear, this came out before Hatefully. It's just that did a really yes. good job of visualizing this scene in a way, yeah. right? That was a snowstorm. This is a sandstorm, but they're yeah. sheltering from the elements. Yes. It's just that pair. It's, a lot of films have done this. People coming from the storm, coming out of the elements mm -hmm. of any type, and the people scoping out the strangers entering in the place where they already are. So we've seen it before. Right. But Hatefully does it best. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. And I enjoyed the tension in the conversation in the tavern, especially the way it ended with the cards thrown at Kalam and landing on the table in a pattern. Yeah, I like that. The, the deck of dragons landing like that is really, really cool. And and I really love the interaction between Sergeant and Kalam there. That guy realizing that uh, I just dodged a massive bullet and a little head nod, of course. Mm -hmm. we, that was just That is too funny. Great episode, man. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts before we drop off here? No, just had a really great episode, man. And uh, thank you all for tuning in this week. Yeah. Good job tonight, Billy. Yeah. Great job, Joe. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.